we're just sort of setting up the teams um, so as well as uh, obviously the group in here uh, we're going to have a number of people watching us on team so it feels very much 2020 uh, ish or 2021 ish so um, so also just do note that the the meeting is being recorded so um, that's just something to bear in mind uh, particularly when it comes to the discussion and the, the question and, and answer session part of the session um, so thank you for making uh, time for today's uh, guest lecture. My name is Patrick Nolan. I'm at the uh, Analytics and Insights team uh, here at Treasury um, and was at the Productivity Commission. Um, really excited by this talk um, today, which will be on unlocking, unlocking New Zealand's productivity potential, the key role of frontier firms. Um, this is based on a draft inquiry report that the Commission recently released, uh, along with some supporting research outputs. Now, this is a a really important topic. Um, you may have noticed that 2020 hasn't been a normal year. There's been the single COVID. Uh, it's had a massive uh, economic shock uh, to the economy, and we're seeing um, quite a remarkable recovery in economic growth, largely on the back of the support of monetary policy and fiscal policy. But there's a limited runway for those sorts of measures. So getting the private sector growth up is going to be incredibly important uh, going forward. And so the question is, well, how do you get that private sector growth and you very quickly land on the importance of frontier firms. So this is a, a really fundamentally important piece of work. So I'm absolutely thrilled um, that um, Murray and Jeff were able to come in and discuss it today. We have an excellent set of speakers and panelists to join us. Uh, first, we'll hear from Murray Sherwin and Jeff Lewis. Uh, Murray is the chair of the commission and uh, Jeff is the director of the inquiry team that's been doing this inquiry. Um, and then we'll also then hear from an excellent panel of speakers. Um, we'll have Dean Ford from Envy, Kieran Brown from uh, was the Berkeley Research Group, but now is Polis Consulting Group, and then Bettina Shea from the Treasury here. And, and how it will run is we'll, um, Murray and Jeff will speak for 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll open to the panelists and they'll provide some reflections, uh, and then we'll sort of open it up to the group as a whole. Um, so some final housekeeping things. So um, in the event of a fire alarm, uh, follow me, um, your Treasury host, uh, to the nearest exit to evacuate the premises and follow the instructions of the fire wardens. Uh, in the event of an earthquake, the correct procedure is to drop, cover and hold. Uh, do not evacuate the building until it's safe to do so. Um, and then finally, in the event of a jurious alarm, uh, please remain where you are until all the is activated. So I think that's probably enough from me. So I will pass it over to Murray and Jeff. So Murray, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick, and uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Treasury for hosting and for Patrick, uh, to Patrick for uh, facilitating this. Um, as Patrick indicated, it's uh, been a, a tricky time to be putting together uh, a piece of work like this uh, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, one of the reasons that we've had three directors, including <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to use everybody else on the call. You're on the UP as well. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, is it possible to make this the presentation large? Uh, the, this is the correct way to Oh, okay. Just worry about the people down the back. Oh, there is another screen. Oh, I don't know. See, that's this is vintage 2020. <laughs> um, and COVID, as I was going to say, was the uh, the other issue that we've been grappling with. And uh, given that our inquiries tend to be very in, uh, consultation and engagement heavy. Um, a little tricky, but uh, the technology has uh, uh, worked out pretty well. Uh, thanks to the team for that. Um, as Patrick said, it's an important inquiry for us. Uh, a lot of our work at the Commission over the years, and uh, knowing, bearing in mind that it's commissioned by ministers, has been either in the public sector or in local government. And we've been keen to uh, spread the wings and, and look more substantively at the um, sort of macro productivity stories, some of the private sector issues. And for those of you who have seen it um, early in his uh, role as, as Minister of Finance, Grant Robertson, um, through the Treasury, commissioned a review by David Skilling of the Commission's work, and and that 
highlighted the the desirability of building up that macro side of the of the system. Um, the other thing that I would note is that we've made a big since the outset made a big investment in the LBD, the longitudinal uh, business database, at firm level micro data, and have been keen to make good use of that uh, building expertise and that the asset that sits in that database. So there's some innovative work in here with the micro data and some cross country analysis uh, where comparable data exists, and that's uh, 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 you know pretty sophisticated work and and very very well uh, very welcome. Um, there's another element which you'll see reflected in the report, and that is um, we've had a lot of experience with the Small Advanced Economies Initiative. We've got uh, Andrew, St uh, Andrew Sweet on board as uh, commissioner who uh, worked on that with Peter Gluckman, and of course uh, the David Skilling stuff uh, reflects that as There's a pile of supporting work also, so it's not just the inquiry report, and you'll see a a number of those uh, in, uh, reports on the website, and there's more of those still to come also, and I think some very, very useful uh, work in there. Some messages that come out of this, uh, one of them is that large firms matter. Um, they tend to be capital intensive, they tend to be R&D intensive, uh, they tend to be export intensive, and skills intensive, uh, from governance and management right through to the range of uh, professional and technical skills. And most of the Sort of comparable small advanced economies have a handful of larger firms of global significance with sophisticated products and services and importantly support a clutch of other smaller firms in the in the ecosystem around them so these larger firms often frontier firms but not always there's a lot of fast charging smaller ones coming through as well uh, they matter in an economy and uh, it's an old an old story for new zealand our export ratios are persistently low uh, the key government had an ambition of lifting that to 40% of GDP. It's remained resolutely stuck at around 30 and may even have slipped a little bit of late. Um, 33% 33 of our firms contribute over half of our exports. Uh, I think less than 300 firms in New Zealand doing more than $25 million a year uh, in exports. Uh, the Deloitte list of our major firms uh, lists only about 40 with turnover greater than a billion dollars per annum. And within that group, when you go through it, there's a very strong domestic market orientation uh, uh, to the, the the firms that are in there. Um, and those that aren't, uh, well, the domestic orientation goes beyond that as well into some of the ownership structures like SOEs, uh, 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 council owned organizations, uh, um, co ops, and so forth. So it's hard when you look there to find. Um, uh, the really strong uh, export and growth orientation and innovation orientation uh, within that within that group of firms. Um, Who <laughs> <laughs> um, was I? There's a lot of uh, issues we've touched on, and you can't cover cover everything in a in a report like this. We'll go through some of the things. We were asked to look at the Maori economy and Maori firms, and uh, thanks to Joe Smith, who led a lot of that work. Um, there's been a persistent story around uh, weak management governance uh, in New Zealand firms, and uh, there's a very nice paper from David Thiessen Kieran, uh, also on our web force, which has uh, contributed to that, and uh, uh, I think there's more work to be done there. Um, uh, and the usual issue that we grapple with is once you've done all of the analysis, where do you find the policy levers? How do you how do you make a difference uh, to all of this? And uh, that's where a lot of the focus in this report will come. And Jeff will be talking more about that uh, later. We end up looking at the the innovation system. How do you promote uh, better performance, uh, stronger R and D linkages, better skills pipelines, smarter pathways to uh, market, and so on? Uh, it's tricky territory to design and even trickier, I think, to implement and uh, implementation is, is, is a real challenge in here. Um, this whole area of, of um, innovation policy, industry policy or whatever is, is one which, I mean, I've spent enough time sitting around large board tables uh, trying to work through the stuff and seeing how hard it is. It's sort of back on the international agenda, uh, the uh, recent um, Global Forum on Productivity from the OECD. Um, was focused around sort of re-emergent industry policy and how you do it. 
Um, this is a very interesting working paper from the IMF with a fascinating title, Crouching Beliefs and Hidden Biases, um, The Rise and Fall of Growth Narratives. And that's a, a piece of text analysis on the last 40 or 50 years of country reports from the IMF, uh, tracing the rise and fall of different stories. And you can see how industry policy is back into the, uh, into the frame there. Uh, which is all fine and good, um, but it doesn't make it any easier to do. So not wishing to steal Jeff's thunder, but um, it's not entirely clear how well our own systems are working, partly because we don't do a hell of a lot of high quality evaluation, hard nosed evaluation. The firms we've been talking to find it hard to navigate, hard to access. They find the system uh, cluttered and riddled with misaligned incentives. Um, and uh, it's in this area, however, that we think we'll find the most effective policy levers. This is a draft report. Uh, the draft is a, is a key part of the Commission's process. Uh, it's an opportunity for people to challenge our interpretations and offer alternative views and uh, uh, and uh, information. Um, so uh, we'll work through this, or the team will work through this and clearly identify what we need to do next. But Jeff, over to you to take us through. Thanks, Murray. Kia ora koutou. I left Treasury uh, nearly 10 years ago as a secondi to help set up the product of education, and I'm still there <laughs> but, uh, as, as a full employee for some time. Uh, but it's always nice to come back to, to Treasury and to see familiar faces. So I'm going to take you through some of the, uh, the major findings and recommendations in this draft report. And remember, it is a draft report, so uh, we we take as given that, that we're not very pleased um, or happy with New Zealand's productivity performance. Uh, we at best we're sort of um, not fairly, not falling further behind other de other developed countries that we compare ourselves with. But partly we manage to do that by working harder rather than smarter. So taking that as given. Uh, our focus is to say, well, what is the presenting problem? Try and diagnose what's going on and then offer some ideas and solutions. So um, I'm not going to be able to see So, yeah, so the, the second slide um, was... Uh, <laughs> was just stating what the purpose of the inquiry is. The purpose being look at ways of maximizing or improving the contribution of frontier firms to the overall performance of the New Zealand economy. That immediately raises the question of, well, why are frontier firms so important? So, um, and by the way, frontier firms, we're meaning the most productive firms in the economy as measured by, you know, either labor productivity or multi-factor productivity. And a lot of the analysis we did, and as, as um, Murray mentioned, we used the micro data on firms. So we got information on firms throughout the economy and we were able to analyze them based on uh, a productivity rankings, even with quite uh, narrow distributions, uh, narrow industries, you get a tremendous uh, range of productivity performance. And we divided firms within an industry into like 10 groups, 10 deciles with the most productive firms, so the firms in the top decile and the, and the least productive in the, in the bottom decile. So that was the um, that was the purpose of the inquiry. I like to use this branding image for the inquiry to explain the contribution of frontier firms. So there we are um, on the lower mountain. And I'll be saying some more about how low our mountain is compared to the global mountain, the best performance in, in the, on the planet. Uh, so the three ways that our frontier firms can help is first or, or that we can change things to so that they make a larger contribution is first of all to raise the height of our mountain so that our product the productivity of our best firms uh, and some of them are very good not denying that is closer to the height of the best best performing firms uh, globally 
the second way is that um, if you think of those figures as the firms, then we want and, and we want the figures at the top of our mountain to be bigger. I don't care if they're taller or fatter, but that means that they're absorbing or using more of the resources of the economy. So that the resources have been taken from the lower slopes to the to the upper slopes and you get more performance that way. And the third way that, that uh, the, the frontier firms can help is by diffusing technology, best practice and innovation to the rest of the firms in the economy. So they pull up those those figures that are lower on lower slopes. So all of those things will help to raise national productivity. So just go to a finding, a major finding in the economy, because we we looked at that first way. How how well are our frontier firms performing relative to um, some comparisons? The comparisons that we were able to make uh, involve looking at other small advanced economies. Our data set um, didn't cover all of them, uh, but it did cover five other ones. So, so we had um, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden and Finland. Uh, there are other ones and they're not all in Europe. Those ones happen to be in Europe, but you know, you've got uh, Israel, you've got Ireland uh, and in Asia, you've got Singapore. But using the ones I mentioned, uh, had the productivity left. We, first of all, we defined a productivity frontier for all of those economies by taking the top three countries within each industry, and that defined a small advanced economy frontier. And then we said for each individual country, what's the ratio between that uh, small advanced economy frontier and the national frontier? And so that this graph displays those ratios over time, and you can see that the the top ones there, Sweden and Belgium, are up uh, around one or even above one. That's uh, just reflecting the way we defined it. But the outstanding thing and a major finding in this report is that the New Zealand ratio is clearly the the lowest one, and it's actually only it started around sixty percent in two thousand and three. But getting up to the to 2016 or 18, whatever it is, uh, it, it had fallen pretty close to 50 percent. So that that's a, a dramatic result. And I think it points the to the fact that somehow we need to change things and up the performance of at that top uh, cohort of firms in the New Zealand economy. So. Um, I just want to give you some good news as well. Because this was another finding we made, and it refers to the allocation of resources within the economy across firms in the different deciles. And actually, quite surprisingly, we found that um, you know this is labor resources in, on the left and capital resources on the right. Each decile, remember, will have the same number of firms, but this is looking at the it's actually the average across industries. Uh, is looking at the proportion of all the labour in the economy, which is employed in the top decile of firms and so forth down. So you see there is a very nice shape there where most of the labour resources are going into the top decile firms and indeed uh, not quite as well. The blue, uh, the brown is New Zealand, the blue is the average of the small advanced economies, uh, not quite as well on capital, but it's still a pretty good shape. Um, the problem is, you see, as I mentioned, is that the New Zealand's top decile is a long way below um, the top decile for the small advanced economies, for the best of them anyway. Uh, so that's that's good news. Um, now we get to a, a sort of part of the diagnosis of why New Zealand firms are, are not, do, frontier firms are not doing so well. Um, we're making these comparisons with other small advanced economies. We often talk about, you know, our small size and distance being barriers. They share some of the same characteristics, perhaps not to the same extent. Uh, but whenever you have small economies and you start talking about, well, how are they going to uh, up their productivity? Uh, and they're all because they're advanced economies, they have to have a competitive advantage and that's not going to be labor cost. You don't want it to be labor cost. So you want it to be the, the quality of the products they're producing. They need to be innovative. They need to be 
probably be specialized. They need to be labor intensive. They need to be distinctive in order to have competitive advantage um, in order to to you know, grab sales and, and earn income for the country and the world market. But for a small econ economy, uh, if you're going to be exporting those specialized products, you need scale. And that means exporting because you very quickly exhaust the domestic market. So this, this graphic is saying that uh, exporting and scale are important, not only because if you're going to be innovative, there are high fixed costs for that, um, that you also have high fixed costs from exporting. When you get into exporting, you've got a whole bunch of costs you've got to overcome. You've got to do research on the market. You've got to know the regulations in that market. You've got to organize your distribution channels and your supply chains. You've got to know the customers in that market. So unless you're doing it on scale, both of those sets of fixed costs are going to get in your way and be a barrier. But if you can get over them and get scale, because marginal costs are a lot lower, you're going to you're going to do well. So that's the challenge. No, I can't get it to move at all. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's the next one. No, not that one. The one before. All right. So uh, if we need if we need more exporting firms at scale, and when you make the comparison with these other small advanced economy, you you do find uh, that they have a they have much higher exports proportion GDP than New Zealand. New Zealand is aspires to be up to 40%, but actually we've fallen back from a peak of about 30% to 28%. So you need you need um, you need these these um, large exporters. Um, and if you look at those other economies, you know, you look at Denmark, you've got uh, Novo Nordisk, you've got Vestas in wind, you've got Maersk in shipping, uh, you've got Grunfoss, you've got Lego. We don't have large exporting firms to the same extent that are exporting distinctive specialized products. Uh, you can perhaps uh, support our exporters to get them to grow more, and NZTE does some great work on that score. Uh, but these other economies do that as well. You might try to import large firms uh, attracting MNCs to New Zealand, and we do say some things about that. The trick is to get the right sort of MNCs, not just ones that are serving the domestic market or attracted here by our natural resources. You need them to be innovative and export orientated. But the third way, and the one we put most emphasis on in this report, in these draft findings and recommendations, is that you need a nursery to grow these firms and to foster them. And that's through an innovation, a good high performing innovation ecosystem. What do we mean by that? Well, this is our diagram for that. Innovation is tricky. It's um, it's got a lot of um, risk. It's it's non-linear. Uh, there's a lot of spillover effects. It requires a lot of things to come together in the right place and time. And so this this diagram shows the things that need to get, you get get right. You need to have Government is an important role. It's important in infrastructure, in regulations, in supplying the right skills, uh, in making international connections. But you also need the entrepreneurs, you need the investors and, and so forth. So all of those things have to work well and they have to be well connected. So it's the capabilities of the separate parts and the connections between them that have to work really well. And some of our findings were about things that are not working well in New Zealand. So, for instance, research, the connections between researchers and firms is not that great in New Zealand. There's a lot of research, but a lot of it is, is not, and not enough of it is with an eye on commercial application. Before making some other comparisons with um, other small advanced economies, I um, wanted to give you a comparison uh, domestically, uh, because part of our terms of reference is to make, uh, is to examine Māori frontier firms. And interestingly, what we found uh, there was that um, 
while Mali frontier firms uh, do face some big challenges in terms of having uh, to re pay close regard to uh, multiple bottom lines, not only economic, but, but social, cultural and environmental in line with Maori values. Uh, they and they have close connection with their with their stakeholders, with their their owners, their iwi and hapu, uh, and they're intergenerational, so they must take a long term view. But rather than those things being a handbrake, we found that many of the best performing Maori firms actually turned these things into a success. They raised their ambition and were able to come up with uh, innovative uh, and distinctive products. So there is there are lessons to be learned there domestically from our best, our leading Māori frontier firms. So to return to the task of um, upgrading uh, New Zealand's innovation ecosystem, uh, how would you go about that? And what this graphic um, is trying to show is that, that the key players that who are on that uh, those spirals that are interconnecting with each other is and we've got government industry and and researchers um perhaps you know, there are others as well but those are absolutely key ones that they need to work together and they need to work together in a way that is not simply the government <coughs> telling them what to do uh the creating this ecosystem needs to be very much a three-way thing of communication between them and effective working together. They each need to have skin in the game. They each need to be listening to each other um, in order to get there. The other major um, and possibly controversial uh, draft finding and recommendation which we've made in this report is that um, the ecosystem is uh, while it, you can see a broad ecosystem covering all parts of the economy, if you've got a small economy, it's impossible to cover the whole gamut of sectors or objectives. And so what we're calling for is, as Murray mentioned, a focused innovation policy. Uh, we avoided the term industry policy because it tends to have knee-jerk reactions and we wanted to put this emphasis on innovation. So what the graphic shows is that there are various layers, the concentric circles of ways in which government is involved in the whole economy really, but some of the things are direct support for innovative activities such as the R&D tax credit, such as um, you know IP regulation, um, and and direct support for for research. Uh, so that's the the inner inner one. Then you get indirect support with things like um, uh, you know competition, access to finance, capital markets, um, the education system, extremely important. Uh, where focused innovation policy comes in is that the areas of the economy that are the focus, you have to do those things more intensively and with an eye on them to make sure that they're working especially well. So you need to have the skills in the area. You need to have the regulations correct in that area and so forth. You need to have venture capitalists who've got that uh, specialist knowledge in that area. So that's the idea uh, between, on focused innovation policy. Another area we looked into um, and we commissioned uh, BRG Institute uh, to research this. Uh, that's uh, Professor David Teese and Kieran on the panel. Um, this is, and we also had ran a joint project with the Institute of Directors to interview uh, some experienced New Zealand directors. The hypothesis we were investigating was because it has been suggested that it's weaknesses in leadership and management that uh, that hold back um, New Zealand's uh, firm performance. So um, what what the particularly the BRG work brought out, uh, but we're also exploring it in the interviews, is that dynamic capabilities are particularly important. So the, the distinction is between ordinary capabilities, which is doing doing things well, um, versus dynamic capabilities, which is doing the right things, and uh, the ordinary capabilities are necessary, but they're not sufficient. 
So uh, dynamic capabilities are around these sort of three things that, that the way you can characterize it is that it's about um, um, sensing opportunities, uh, seizing those opportunities and then following through uh, with transformation radical uh, where, where that's required. It won't always be radical. I'm sure Kieran will talk more about that. Uh, we also, in the course of the um, in the course of the inquiry, uh, conducted some case studies of particular parts of the economy. These are important parts of the economy in wh which exporting is important. Uh, we weren't saying they should be the focus areas, not at all, but we wanted to get under the bonnet of the economy and really look at closely at a number of areas. So we looked at dairy, horticulture, particularly kiwi fruit and wine. We looked at health technology and computer systems and services. So, you know, you, we're thinking of in health tech, you know, we got Fisher and Pike or healthcare. Uh, we know gold, kiwi fruit um, and Zespri is a success story. Uh, and we know, uh, you know, we've got zero and datacom in computer services. So these areas were fairly natural choices. But the point of this slide is that we came across regulatory settings or, or other opportunities which could be improved and which we felt were holding back progress um, and 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 <clears throat> making it less likely that innovation would happen in these areas. So we looked at migration policy, how that is um, a factor in the um, in the horticulture industry in particular, a lot of low skill labor coming in, whereas we looked at other places where um, and some of them in New Zealand, where that was that lab, low cost labor wasn't available. And so it was a spur for innovation and greater investment in automation and, and, and capital generally. Um, we looked at things in the dairy sector that we felt we felt needed to be uh, things that um, you want a dairy sector which is performing within the environmental limits that it faces. Uh, and generally in the primary sector, we think our GM regulation is out of date. It has not kept up with uh, technolo technological developments in things like gene splicing and gene editing. Uh, in the fintech sector, for example, there are opportunities there to be our firms to be world leading, but you need consumer data rights. A uh, particular example of that is open banking. And uh, we felt that for health tech, there's, there's more scope for uh, good interactions, productive interactions between the DHBs and firms in the health tech sector. So finally, uh, this slide, you won't be able to read it in, in, um, in any depth, but I'll tell you what it's showing. We did this mapping of all the ways in which currently uh, agencies and both within government and some of them outside government are providing services to help firms boost their innovation performance and boost their exporting performance. We found that there is a bewildering array of such uh, programs spread across a lot of agencies. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's likely to be confusing for firms to get the best out of the resources that are being put in. And it's unlikely that we're getting the best from a national objective point of view. So we called for uh, a review of, of that array. Um, uh, that perhaps it can be better organized um, to get more out of it, as well as the question of perhaps more resources overall. So that's where I'll leave it. Um, I'm keen to hear what the panelists have got to say. I'm very keen to hear what um, what the audience um, reaction to our draft report is. So uh, you can read the full report. Uh, there's a nice eight page overview, which tells you more than, than I been able to say and uh, please do get in touch with us because the inquiry is not finished yet. We've got a final to produce by the end of March. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, um, thank you, uh, Jeff and Murray. So we'll pass over to the panelists uh, soon. I, I also thank you for persisting uh, with the, the technology. I was reflecting on it and um, consistent with your messages about innovation. Uh, innovation can be hard um, and can be tricky. Um, but I would note we had something like, at one point we had 71 viewers online, which is about what we've got in the room. So it shows that it's definitely worth persisting with because we're kind of doubling the impact of um, the reach of this tool. Um, uh, so Jeff, you and Murray, you raised some key points around um, New Zealand's productivity performance, keeping up, not catching up. 
um, there's this connection between the frontier and the global, domestic frontier and the global frontier kind of emerging as a, kind of the key part of the productivity narrative. Probably interestingly less so than the reallocation point, which I think is very important. Um, the importance of specialised exports, um, which is the magic question, something we've been worrying about in New Zealand for many decades. And so, well, what's the secret sauce? Um, so I was really interested in your thoughts around like what makes a good innovation uh, ecosystem. So I think we've got the perfect panel to to pick up on that. So I'll just go on this one. So I'll, I'll pick on you, Dean. Maybe a few reflections, Dean, Kieran, and then Bettina, and then I'll get Murray to sort of react to your comments. And sure. Uh, can I, can I might just go to the link so people yeah. can see me, so I can see those people at the back. But I'll be really short. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm Dean Ford. Um, I kind of do this stuff at MB. So um, for those of you that are part of the public service, you'll know around about Christmas there's always a, a kind of a list of proposed topics that go around for the next year's uh, Productivity Commission's inquiries. And as a good public servant, you try to think, well, what's best for the, the for New Zealand and what are the, the topics that are really going to help? And then there's another party that goes, oh, and I'll tick my one as well. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was fantastic to see um, this inquiry being focused right on work. So thank, thank you to the Commission for doing it. Um, I really value it. Um, I just, just wanted to get one thought on it. It was about this innovation ecosystem and kind of almost reframe the, the, the question a little bit for how I think about it. And it works something like this. If, if we want to have a really good innovation ecosystem in New Zealand, you need to stimulate some sort of research and development or commercialisation. And there's, there's, there's benefits from that that spill over to other firms. So you can't expect the private sector to necessarily deliver it. Because if I come up with something really amazing, then probably my competitor will be able to copy it. So the market solution is to underinvest. So that's why you see there's a whole lot of different programs about trying to invest in the ecosystem. And some of them are great, some of them are not. But that's why you see there's a whole lot of systems there. Then the, the next thing that the, the, um, the report um, states really well, actually, is, is this idea that there's these barriers in New Zealand to being able to export. Um, you should always think about New Zealand as it's, we're not a small country. We're a really large country with a small number of people. So if you stretch New Zealand, you, you go from something like London to Moscow. That's a really big country. So if you're trying to do something to even sell from, say, Invercargill to Wellington, let alone Invercargill to California, it's really, really hard. So that's where the work of uh, NZT and NFAT and the rest of the, the offshore network is really important to help firms internationalise. But this is the kicker question, is that say if we create a really innovative firm and it's internationalised and it's successful, why would it stay in New Zealand? And if you don't answer that question, all the system will do is generate firms that leave New Zealand. Um, I grew up in a little place in the South Island called Kaikoura. The reason I live in Wellington is because of you. This is the ecosystem that allows an economist to have a really fulfilling career. And that's what you need to do with these innovative firms, is how do you create an ecosystem that means that when you've internationalised, you go to California and you see there's this amazing kind of agri-tech industry over there. You think, well, rather than shifting shop and setting myself up in California, I stay in the Bay of Plenty. So in Wellington, we should ask, so zero. Um, it's a firm that started out in Wellington. It eventually listed on the New Zealand Exchange. Then it dual listed into Sydney, plus into Australia. And now it's only listed in Australia. What would we want to have happen such that that firm stays in New Zealand for long enough? Because guess what, eventually it's going to go. And when it does, we want, as soon as it vacates the Wellington presence, a firm that's just like it says, oh, wow, there's space open up in the Wellington waterfront right next to Trade Me and all these other amazing software firms that it quickly goes in. And if you have this ecosystem established, as soon as things go overseas, um, another, another comes in and replaces it really quickly. And, and that, that's where I just wanted to make a couple of points about um, industry policy. Because th this is the point where it's things beyond the firm. How do you set up this ecosystem? And part of it's about the innovation system and having universities talk to each other and all this sort of stuff. But a lot of it is actually just about industry policy. And there's kind of a, a few different ways that you can get this. And they, um, to my kind of economist training, become 
increasingly unpalatable. We'll see how the room reacts. So you start off, you want to get everyone collaborating. See so if something like uh, you send me and my team out, we go, right, we're going to figure out about this industry transformation plan and we're going to talk to each other and figure out what the problems are and we'll, we'll share ideas and that, that's something that really helps develop this ecosystem. And that's usually something we, we kind of like. Uh, then the next cab along the rank is where you say, actually, the thing that this industry really needs is this bit of uh, kit or capital or something. And we borrow some money off our children, so they miss out on maybe a little bit of health services or a little bit of education services in 20 years' time. And we borrow that money forward and we build some. And that is something we do, and if it works, that's great, and it'll build an industry. Um, if that doesn't work, you start to get into tax breaks and eventually subsidies and it starts to get a little bit harder to justify. But eventually, if you don't do something unpalatable, you risk just this, this uh, I guess, agglomeration effect, drawing things overseas. And it's really hard to know what to do, what's right, but that's almost the frame we've got to think about. Um, and that's where the Commission had this, this call to say, figure out what it is you want to do and prioritise. So don't just throw money at everything, figure out what you really like. So. Um, for that, I'm kind of just going to put a challenge to the room. Is if I said to you, what are the industry priorities in New Zealand right now? What would the answer be? Now, you might look at the Commission's report and say, oh, MB's doing this industry transformation plan program, and the priorities are agri tech, digital tech, advanced manufacturing, and all these sorts of things. And I'd say to you, well, actually, the priorities in New Zealand are screen industry, tourism, agriculture. And the, the recent example of uh, a limited space in the managed isolation and quarantine facilities, that was a pretty good illustration of what our industry priorities were as well, uh, because we brought a whole lot of cricketers in rather than high value people to really care about sport. Mm. And it's not to say that those decisions are wrong. These are things that New Zealand has kind of thought about and got to. But it's worth just pausing for a moment and saying, oh, the same point. Well, well, the problem here isn't about making the innovation system necessarily better, although that would be a really useful thing. It is about well, how would we change some of those big priorities? How would we say, actually, do we really need to have $110 million a year um, marketing tourists to come to New Zealand, particularly when the borders close? Um, but why don't we put that into a different industry? Anyway, so just to summarise, my main points really is um, Thanks so much for the inquiry, it's really good. I'd really like to see, I guess, in the, the final report, something that just kind of brings in a little bit more about how you set up this kind of ecosystem and the innovation stuff. I thought it was it was really curious. So a long way through the, the report, it talks about collaboration, and then towards the end says, oh, I would like to break Fonterra up a bit. And I appreciate that's kind of a throwaway summary of, of quite a bit of detailed work. <laughs> but it, it is this idea of when is it good to have competition and when is it good to work together? You think about, say, um, Zespri. If, if that was a competitive market where there was no kind of, you know, no bring together, would that industry have survived PSA back in 2011 or wherever it was? And I'd say, well, probably not. But then ask the question: So why is it that that's the structure for kiwi fruit? And we don't have apples or something else. Anyway, again, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know, are we allowed questions? Should we just go through the panel and then come to the questions? Okay. Kia ora koutou, ko Kira Brown, taka ingoa ko Ngāti Rokao ko Iwi, ko Horofinoa te papakainga, no reina tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora Murray and Jeff, um, and thank you to the Commission for this great work and for involving David Tees and I, we thoroughly enjoyed it. And also, uh, to talk to uh, Professor Sally Davenport, my PhD supervisor, who's here today. We looked at management and we looked at capabilities. Um, other people were looking at the economics. And um, I just want to reflect uh, on a very classical economist, John Sutton from the London School of Economics, who um, is not a, a management hand waver, said the proximate cause of the difference in the wealth of nations lies for the most part in the capabilities of firms. And I thought I'd also reflect on Lord Keynes, who said, if human nature felt no temptation for investment that had to rely only on cold calculation, there may be little investment at all. 
So we looked at capabilities of uh, New Zealand firms, and I must say that there's significant limitations to the, to the exercise. Data was few, the research was few, some of it was poor. So we had to look at New Zealand data as well as global data uh, on capabilities and management. So to summarize a very long uh, period of time, David and I looked at this is uh, management in New Zealand firms is relatively poor. It's down there with Portugal and Poland. The management orientation of firms and frontier firms is very central. It's inward looking. Innovation is seen as largely a closed process. And there's a great misunderstanding and suspicion of co-opetition or collaboration. The number of joint ventures and international alliances were few, and those that were there were relatively poor quality. <coughs> and uh, collaboration is incredibly hard. And as we saw from that hugely busy uh, map, uh, the innovation ecosystem is fractious. There's a uh, hundred kete with $10 each and people are very confused about how to engage with the system. And uh, you know all the evidence uh, we put together uh, in the paper, but to summarize the role of capabilities and particularly dynamic capabilities. So there's ordinary capabilities. You know, David's been looking at this for 25 years and you know I've had the great privilege of sort of working with him over a decade, uh, researching and writing, but also advising and a lot of time uh, in Silicon Valley and Southeast Asia and more recently, South Africa. There's a lot of very interesting uh, innovation and entrepreneurialism happening there and in West Africa. And firms that had dynamic capabilities were more resilient to economic shocks. They attracted better talent, they paid higher wages, and they were more productive. And a reflection we had uh, on firms in New Zealand and even the innovation ecosystem here is that is a strong orientation towards value creation. We have to do it ourselves. We need more R&D. We're going to do the science. We're going to do the technology. And very little attention was pay, paid to the value capture part of the innovation equation, which is sensing a lot of the technology uh, and exogenous science that already exists. That can be tapped. A lot of it's hanging out there free or it can be achieved through an alliance or a joint venture or m &A, uh, or white labelling. And a huge amount of that can be brought to New Zealand and diffused and adopted across firms uh, with technologies and management processes and methods that we already know uh, drive productivity growth. So what were the recommendations of, of our piece was building dynamic capabilities in firms and frontier firms is a good idea. We suggested a pilot with a select cohort and full credit to Callahan Innovation who we're working with on that right now. We also set a cross sector, very high level senior people involved on a frontier firm program that gets a bit more aggressive and a bit more uh, muscular with supporting these frontier firms. And we should know very, very intimate details about these firms. The Singaporeans do this, the Taiwanese do this, the Finns, the Danes, the Dutch, and the British. I've just returned back uh, to New Zealand after eight years, uh, sort of between Berkeley and London, and um, the conversation uh, had between the Commission and MB and Callaghan and DPMC on innovation is is um, is very different. Um, is is very different. And some work um, David and I have been doing recently on the role of innovation agencies and the role of the state sitting between private firms uh, in the innovation ecosystem says, you know, a number of these uh, organizations and agencies, uh, we looked into Scandinavia and the UK and uh, Israel, is a lot of these agencies are moving away from sector-based policy. In the UK, we don't talk about sectors in industrial policy anymore. We talk about challenge-led policy and we talk about mission-oriented policy where there's a very few priorities, for three, five and that is it and the entire industrial complex uh, circles around those uh, priorities innovation agencies also in those places are not PL organizations they don't chase revenue they don't have uh, a customer winning work uh, orientation in new zealand there's been a lot of criticism that the innovation ecosystem is, is very competitive it's very contentious they're trying to um, you know, uh, earn revenue, and uh, that's not the most efficient uh, way of orientating the system. And I suppose finally uh, is this idea that capabilities or a micro foundational view of firms 
and that capabilities, particularly the valuable dynamic capabilities, are the ones that will produce super normal profits and sustained competitive advantage for New Zealand. And I suppose this is a story about evolution, not transformation. Both in the way the innovation system is orientated, evolving that, evolving ourselves into the idea that backing winners is a great idea. Most of the OECD can't be wrong. And this isn't some terrible corporate welfare uh, that we should all uh, be afraid of. And I think that the challenge uh, David and I have got uh, for this inquiry or a, a widow to drop for you, uh, Murray, is how can we evolve from describing the problem extremely well and elegantly and get into the messiness of how? And the institutional changes, the financial and budgetary changes and the political narrative changes, which will give effect to this excellent draft report. Kia ora koutou. Um, and Bettina, you don't have to go up here by the way, you can do it from here. I might do it from here. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Bettina Shear, I'm from the New Zealand Treasury. Um, I'm a Principal Advisor and um, I've been working in this sort of area of innovation policy for a number of years. Um, not so much in the Treasury, but previously at NB Ministry of Economic Development and so in private sector consultants. Um, I'd like to congratulate the Productivity Commission on the report. I think it's absolutely on the mark. I think the issues that we're grappling with are central to improving New Zealand's productivity performance. And I do think in, in that in that um, territory that you know David Skilling's review is being addressed by the, exactly this kind of inquiry. So congratulations on that. Um, I found myself pretty much agreeing with everything you were saying in the report. Um, but I'd particularly like to commend the case study approach um, and the recommendation, recommendations on the sector specific regulatory issues. Um, I believe, in, in contrast, maybe a little bit um, to one of my panelists here, Kieran, that I think it is really important to dig into those more uh, sector specific barriers and incentives. And that's where some of the real headway can be made. And even though the, the broad based incentives are really important, I think these kinds of idiosyncratic constraints on innovation can be really powerful. Um, and removing them can, can have really um, make big strides. Um, so I really you know, commend you in, in that section of the report and see that as quite high priority. Um, I guess the other thing I, I sort of reflect on is. Um, you know, those kinds of regulatory opportunities, if you like, exist in both the big areas of existing competitive advantage, like dairying and health, um, as much as they do in the more novel high tech areas like the space industry, for example. I think bigger strides can actually be made by focusing on those really big existing areas of competitive advantage that we have. Um, and so I guess my overall recommendation is that, that the national innovation policy needs to be complemented with that deeper understanding of sectoral innovation systems. And MB and Callaghan Innovation and NZTE can play a really crucial role here. They need to bridge the public and private sectors um, to, to enable that information exchange to go on. And they need to do that in a sustained kind of manner over, over many, many years. Um, I think that one thing I'd say about MD and Callaghan Innovation is that they shouldn't confuse high tech with high innovation. Uh, and this is where I kind of agree with some of Kieran's recommendations around dynamic capabilities and management capability as needing to be a focus of, of policy, as well as things like competition policy, sort of referenced in the, in the dairy industry example and the report. Um, so the the, the range of policies that might lead to higher innovation performance needs to be broader than just thinking about R&D investment, for example. Um, I think that's, yeah, I'll just make a comment about fragmentation. Um, it's been an issue for so long in the New Zealand Public Service, um, particularly in this area. People want to give everybody a little bit um, and, and um, 
I'm not actually sure what the solution is there, but the, the report starts talking about a need to change the way governance works in this area. And I think that's going in the right direction. But I'd, I'd agree with Kieran that more specifics on how you actually make that, that government, you know, why, how you change the governance to, to um, reduce fragmentation is, would be a critical part of the final report, hopefully. Um, I've also, uh, over many years, tried to get systemic evaluation programs happening in the New Zealand Public Service. And I think um, that's a problem not just in innovation policy, that's a systemic problem in the New Zealand Public Service. And um, it's, it's <coughs> something we need to address as a, as a whole public service, I think, to improve our evaluation of programs and do it system systematically. We, we don't actually have many barriers. We've got fantastic world-leading data infrastructure. We've got great capability. We actually just need to make it um, a sort of a choice, I guess, as a public service to really focus efforts in that area and possibly also some <coughs> governments along those lines as well to, to make people focus on that side of the problem. Okay. Well, uh, thank you um, to our panellists. Um, so Dean started by talking about some of New Zealand's unique geography and then made some points um, around industry policy and, and basically we've got to the point that it's hard to choose, I guess. Um, you know, but we, we are, as David Scullin's very destined to choose in a way. Um, um, but also, how do you get the, um, how do you actually set up the ecosystem? Kieran actually echoed some similar thoughts, um, um, you know, sort of focusing on management and capabilities, um, the orientation of New Zealand's managers, um, and how do you get, um, how do you go from a very good description of the problem to the how, which also was a theme that Bettina uh, kindly uh, mentioned. So I guess that's a challenge for, for you and uh, Jeff and, and Murray as you go from draft to final. So I don't know if you've got any reflections. You probably want to talk about Fonterra, but maybe if you uh, <laughs> look at Fonterra. Yeah. Just, a, just a couple of observations from me. I mean, I thought those, that was a useful, really useful set of, uh, of comments and uh, thank you to our panelists. Dean, I think it's uh, the really key question. I mean, why would a successful firm stay in New Zealand? And uh, I think that's something, you know, we, we dwell on that as we as we go through this sort of work as well. Uh, and the way I think about that is that when I look at the New Zealand economy, uh, in many respects, it looks a lot like it did a, a long time ago, uh, that very heavy primary industry uh, focus. And, uh, you know, why is that? And I think the answer is it's, it's a Darwinian process. Um, but if, you, if you're in the dairy industry in New Zealand, um, you know, 90 to 95% of your milk is going to end up on somebody else's cornflakes. It's not going to end up in a New Zealand consumer's cornflakes. You have to be competitive internationally. If you're not, you're going to die. Uh, and the industry has gone through near-death experiences on a few occasions when the world market has turned sour or whatever. And it's come out the other side because they've had to go through the hard decisions, the uh, the innovations, the, the cost cutting, the uh, uh, the new approaches to doing things that actually, in that case, in those in those near-death experiences, the co-op model probably works pretty well because the farmers will survive on not a hell of a lot for quite a long period of time until they come out the other side. Um, what it doesn't do so well is, is thrive in the in the growth and innovation phase. I mean, I think, you know, to go to Fonterra, they have some really smart operations and would be at the top end of a lot of large basic processing and actually in highly uh, specialized uh, ingredients into the food industry developed with their with their customers. Um, but they are destined to be capital constrained and governance constrained by the model. And uh, you're not going to get the sort of growth out of them that you might out of, uh, out of a, a sort of a Google or a high tech firm of, of, of that sort. And you can go through the other primary industries as well. So, you know, the, uh, the Zespri and the Kiwi fruit is much the same, a lot of horticulture and other industries. They can't survive on the New Zealand market, it's too small. What comes out of the engagements, quite close engagements with, that we've been having with the likes of NZTE, is that these firms, successful firms in New Zealand, can quite quickly uh, reach a point where they are uh, you know, beginning to saturate the local market. So they have to start looking abroad. And that leap abroad is uh, across the chasm of death. Um, it's really, really hard, and and uh, Peter Crisp will say, well, they hit the, the foreign markets, uh, not match fit, but come out of competition light 
uh, environments in New Zealand and discover that even the Australians don't actually wrap them up with open arms and welcome them to take a share of their market. Uh, it's tough. Uh, and uh, again, a little anecdotal, but talking to the director of, of actually a very successful firm here that found they had 75 odd percent of the local market, looked at Australia, spent a long time thinking about how to make a inroads there, decided it was going to take six or seven years of negative cash flows uh, and couldn't do it, sold up, it's gone. So what's what's the anger? What's the anger that can hold that? Well, those those um, primary industry groups are likely to be here because they're resource based. That's where they're going to come from. Great, uh, and they have to be in those international markets, which means they have to be productive. They have to be competitive. They have to be able to survive somehow in that, in that environment. There is an opportunity, I think, for growing the the ecosystem around those sorts of firms, uh, and there's a bit of that taking place. And and uh, you know, I, I think a, a good system of uh, uh, innovation and uh, support would, would help encourage that. What comes out of the inquiry is that uh, so many of the firms, including in these uh, primary industry areas, find it really difficult to work with the research community. Uh, they find the uh, incentives are misaligned. They want to go and work with a, a university or elsewhere. Uh, it just doesn't work to, to get the time frames and the quality of the analysis and all the rest of it. You start asking the firms, who are the key people in the R&D ecosystem that are critical to you? Uh, and you won't get a lot of answers. Um, you know, they'll go offshore uh, to find the right skills at times. I think, again, thinking about that R&D uh, area, how it works and how it connects with industry and some of the incentives around the, uh, the, the researchers that take them away from working with industry and into, into other areas is, is one of the critical parts of that. Um, so skills pipelines also matter coming out of our out of our education establishments and into our into our uh, growing companies. Despite that conversation that I've just had about the the you know, ongoing uh, and Darwinian induced importance of our primary industries, boy, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on and some really interesting firms flying under the radar uh, in you know pretty sexy techy very. 2020 type industries, and that's that's fabulous to see. You know, born global, born digital, all of that. Um, and I can tell you that a hell of a lot of them just look at the uh, local innovation system and say it's too hard, too distracting. We've got business to do. Let's bypass it. And uh, um, you know, that's that's a challenge for us all. Thanks. Um, Jess, do you want to come in on that? But also, Dean and Bettina, um, are you going to fix this? <laughs> <laughs> Particularly, I mean, think Murray's last point that actually, um, in part of the inquiry, a lot of the really innovative firms we talk to are just not engaging with the innovation government support. I mean, they're just, they're just not interested in getting on and doing it. Is that a good or a bad thing? I mean, it might be good to they're just getting on and doing it, but reflections or. I, I, I always somewhat cheaply say that working with the New Zealand government is just as easy as working with any firm with 450,000 staff spread between. London and Moscow mm -hmm. with a board that has a go at murdering itself every three years and succeeds every nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, seriously, more, more seriously though, that, that, is, that is a really concerning thing and we do mm -hmm. hear it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my, my, my kind of thinking on this, why, why do firms stay or not, it's um, the real challenge of getting a location agnostic firm to stay in New Zealand. So it doesn't really matter where it is, it chooses to be in New Zealand. If, if the thing that you need to be successful to be this firm depends on having access to, to grass, then you'll probably be here. Whereas if it doesn't, you'll you'll feel this pressure to go because you'll find that even by going to Australia, your labour productivity will go up by 40% or whatever the next number is. And so if the innovation ecosystem isn't there, that, that's a real concern. Um, there was one point I forgot to make though, that that we do have in our favour, and that's the, the Māori economy. Um, and it's um, getting back to my Dean leaving Kaikoura to be an economist in, in Wellington, uh, that there was another guy in my class um, uh, who ended up staying in Kaikoura, and now he runs Whale Watch. And the reason he stayed is because he's Māori, and so his connection was to that place. And so no matter how successful a lot of iwi businesses are, they're not going to move to Melbourne because they want to be in New Zealand. And that doesn't, it's, it's not a good reason to have a whole economy based on it. We don't want to say that the, the 
the reason Scott Technology is in Dunedin is because the owners really like the Highlanders. That, that's not a not a sustainable thing. But if you have the starting point of those businesses, which means another one is near it and another one's near it, and then you build this ecosystem. And I'm not sure how we fix the the, the government supported innovation ecosystem, but yeah, that's kind of the stuff I'd like to try and get to. Um, well, uh, one thing we, we, we sort of explored about 10 years ago was this idea that you actually, that we're sort of underutilising the accountability arrangements that we have with Crown Research Institutes and tertiary institutes that, that receive um, a lot of funding from government, and that we could be taking a more system wide approach to thinking about how we encourage. Um, those connections with industry uh, and use those accountability arrangements essentially to encourage um, those connections more broadly and to do that across the whole system as opposed to um, trying to do it in, in you know, small parts and or through individual programs um, that use that kind of, I guess, crown, crown role in accountability arrangements. And that's with the Crown Research Institutes is held with an MB, um, but the TEC obviously has a big role to play in the tertiary education side. So it's how, how you get those bits of the system to kind of join up. Kieran, just a very quick reflection, I guess based on your international experience this, and then I'll get Jeff to maybe give us some more sort of, sort of reflections as well. So. Um, given what you've seen, and you mentioned in your, your, your remarks what you've seen, the conversations are very different in London than you would see here. So, um. Um, yes, the conversations are very different. Um, David and I did some work 2014-15 with the UK Parliamentary Science and Technology Select Committee, and the entire industrial policy apparatus has moved towards challenge-based policies. Sector-based policies tend to favour incumbents, it tends to rehash rules and market dynamics that already exist and deepen them. So the entire industrial strategy complex in the UK is now around five challenges and specific mission, missions. Because the nature of 21st century economy, particularly the digital economy, is horizontal and it cuts across. It's not, it doesn't fit into a elegant sectoral analysis or a sectoral policy. Also, the uh, industrial agency uh, ecosystem in the UK, it doesn't have a PL, it's bulk funded. It focuses on three things orchestrating the ecosystem, giving money, and producing rare and valuable knowledge that private firms, and frankly, the state, can't produce themselves. It doesn't chase customers, it doesn't have products, it just does those three things. And I think. Uh, uh, less is more, so the UK is substantially larger than New Zealand, but they have five areas of priority, and the buckets of money are much fewer and much larger, which simplifies yeah. the system. Well, you say it's a kind of a key theme, I guess, emerging around prioritisation, but the challenge is, and this is uh, no doubt you'll solve this between draft and final, is, is how to how to make that work. So, if you've got some sort of more reflections, yeah, well, I, I'm. Conscious that uh, people will have questions and want to leave plenty of time for that. Um, but just, just on this question of stickiness, how do we make New Zealand sticky for these firms that are otherwise mobile if it's not through our natural resources or because it's home? Uh, I think the point about the ecosystem is absolutely vital. Um, if there's exciting research going on here in an area, if there is, um, if there are the skilled people here that firms can use, if the regulations are conducive, if all of those things line up, then you get the stickiness to anchor these firms in New Zealand. I think that's fundamentally important. On the question of the choices of these uh, focus areas, uh, we're not going to specify them, uh, but we are agnostic about whether they should be sectorally based, um, dairy, uh, you know, horticulture, or whether they should be across uh, a whole range of technologies applied to a particular part of the economy, such as agri-tech, or if they could be mission-led. So uh, let's have a real focus on transforming the economy to low emissions and all the innovation and technological spin-offs from that. So 
So we are agnostic on that. And I think just one final point about, I uh, take uh, Karen's point about the messiness of implementation, and that's something we're thinking about a lot more, or will be thinking about a lot more between draft and final. But one uh, critical factor uh, you can do in successful implementation and doing this well is a uh, high level political commitment. And that's what you see in these other small advanced economies. You see, at the very least, senior ministerial commitment, um, even prime ministerial commitment, an innovation council or something like that, which can mean that you know you do get the the focus, operation, and importantly the resources that are going into these areas, so we don't fall into uh, lots of little sub therapeutic doses. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jeff. And so there were, I, there was a question for Dean earlier. So what I might do is, <clears throat> we've got 18 minutes, so I might take a group of questions and then pass them to Murray and Jeff in, in the panel. So, um, what was that, the question earlier? Oh, yeah, sorry, so, sorry, I couldn't take it then. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, so it was about you were talking about ecosystems and, um, <laughs> and funding and that and borrowing from our future gener generations and if that fails, having to, having to look at these palatable things like tax. I was interested that tax wasn't quite up there in the top of that list of how do you create an ecosystem? Because if you look at countries like Ireland, which isn't perfect, but they've created an ecosystem and they've been charged a lot of money by the EU for it, um, so perhaps EU law, but um, they, they now have an innovative ecosystem for tech companies, notwithstanding all that history. Um, and that's because of tax. Okay. Yeah, um, Kinsley, congratulations on the report. I thought it was a fantastic read, very well written, I'm envious of your skills. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about you mentioned um, in the report infrastructure funding by the government, and this is a very big touch point for most analysts of the right papers in that the, what's the role of government in, in providing upfront funding or co investing on large infrastructure? Um, um, projects, for example, uh, New Zealand refinery, uh, sorry, I work for forestry, we could potentially take our logs, put it through the refinery and make biofuel for New Zealand. But we're always told that this isn't a role for government to fund or co-fund large infrastructure projects like that. And I'm interested on the take on that. Um, yeah, sorry, that aligns with the uh, tax question. This, I, I want to just uh, make an observation and then make a question. First of all, um, just be inspired by Dean's uh, remarks. So I'm saying this as a fan of the of, of productive government because I learn a lot from this report. Point number one is, um, are we taking enough of a strength-based approach um, to productivity uh, in the report? Uh, and scholarly to that question is, are we uh, dovetailing previous reports that the Commission has already produced and integrating that into the recommendation. So, and I'll give you a couple of points. Point number one, as someone who worked in California, I worked in Europe's high tech firms, high productivity firms, I can say that though there are amazing people who work in these hubs, a lot of the tech industry is morally bankrupt. Okay. New Zealand is is a good, uh, not it's a good, it's a people place, like being from the Dean's point. Mm. We as a people, what values do we represent? How we mentioned productivity against tax. And technically, we have done a good job, but that's one of the technical challenges in the measurements should be something that should show up in our, in our, in our performance. And therefore, the priority to the question is the one that we kind of uh, pussy put it around, sorry, around the public sector area. What is the culture or the dynamic leadership capability of innovation for that? projects in the public sector and to lead by example. And you can look at it CERN, you can look at all other people. And so there's a lot of economics around this, but there's a disproportionate uh, risk uh, allocation for a public service, like, like you know, a lot of people in the room. If they do something wrong, they don't have a career. If you do the, something right, what are the incentives for the public service? And I'm not going to be here, but that's a question for <laughs> um, and I'll take last question from Sally. I, I just wanted to um, throw a sort of a spin on a bit slightly to challenge about the whole point about um, the fact that the number of firms from Zealand being sold offshore is always a bad thing. 
I mean, I think yes, there's a whole point about trying to embed them in an innovation ecosystem and network so that they're reliant and connected to each other. But actually, there's a lot of positives that come from this as well. And I think you know, I can remember us sort of saying we're going to shut down the borders and over things are going to be about allowed to go overseas about 20 years ago. And I think we need to move on a little bit. All right, thank you. Um, Murray, did you want to sort of pick up on some of those questions? Um, well, <clears throat> just try to pick up on, on a couple of them, but others will, will have uh, uh, things to say as well. Uh, the place of tax incentives, um, yes, the Irish have used them heavily. Uh, <laughs> I first looked at the Irish systems when I was at the OECD in 1979, believe it or not, and uh, uh, they were then beginning to haul a lot of investment in, but it was you know, again specific to where they are and how they are, and you, basically American firms getting tax efficient entree into into the EU. Um, I have to say one of the things that I hadn't quite anticipated was how much criticism there was of the R and D tax credit arrangements here in, in New Zealand. Uh, a lot of it coming back from firms that are finding it uh, quite difficult to uh, to access and to use. On infrastructure funding and where that fits in, yeah, the, this whole debate about innovation policy and and uh, industry policy and where the boundaries are, because you can draw them very broadly around skills development and certainly uh, infrastructure. And I think that that sort of map that Jeff had up on the board has infrastructure in there. And you can see right now uh, the payoff that we've had, for instance, for the impact uh, in, in the impact of investment in the uh, uh, the fibre ne network, the uh, ultra fast broadband, and so forth, and that I think was a you know one of those areas where the market by itself was not going to pull that together in the way that it was, and with the distribution that it has, and you can think of roadings and all the rest of it. Boy, where we fail often is, is getting our pricing right on all of that, um, and including on roads, uh, and uh, there's there's big gaps there with big implications I think for uh, uh, everything from uh, distributional impacts and, and so on through to uh, what actually gets done. Um, I wouldn't put a biorefinery in that category of, of necessary government uh, investment. Uh, I thought that was closer to the commercial end of the system, um, but I know enough about the forestry industry to know that they'll struggle to put it together. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that. There's a few questions in there for Dean, I think. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, did you want to come in next and then I'll, I'll bring in the panel? So. Yeah, uh, much the same comments as Murray, actually. Um, another example of an infrastructure uh, venture, is, uh, the, although I, I don't know a lot about it, is the government investment in, uh, in Taranaki, in, in it, exploring the options for uh, transformation to a, a, you know, a renewable energy economy. I think that's the sort of area where if there is a big shift in the paradigm, um, there's, there's a very good paper, uh, very respectful, I think it's in the, the AER or Colometric Cup, um, uh, and uh, yeah, but that talks about um, the government needing to shift shift the paradigm to, to a new one because the private sector is not going to do that because the because innovation uh, is an increasing returns game. Um, the returns in the in the immediate terms, the private returns are going to be to go with the status quo. So that's an example of uh, I think it just uh, the UFB investment has has been I mean been fundamental to triggering the the software industry and, and, and a lot else. So that's another good example. Um, yeah, firms going offshore, that, that's going to happen. Um, we were talking yesterday to, to in, a, in a sort of webinar situation, Export New Zealand with GlidePath. I didn't realise, but they're, they're a classic New Zealand firm that's, that's grown up here and sold technology to the world, but it's, it's now, be, now owned by, um, now being sold offshore by a German company. I don't know whether that's because um, they needed the capital that some of the owners wanted to sell out. It could have been that. Uh, it could be that to get better distribution channels. It could be access to more appropriate R and D. But it, but it is going to happen. Yeah. And uh, just on the public sector, someone mentioned, and and the people, New Zealand being a people place, and no one's mentioned so far the opportunity that there is now, 
at this time, post-COVID, and the attention of the world and the popularity of New Zealand, when a lot of talented people coming back, there is an opportunity to get things going here and to get the critical mass. And that will it's in, if we succeed in that, New Zealand will become a, a, a place where talent wants to live and businesses want to stay. Thank you. Um, so I'll pass to the panel now, so just quick reactions, I guess, to those questions. So Dean, there are a few for you, so we'll start with you. And <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just take one, one and then I'll just take the, 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 the easiest one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was this idea of um, how should we feel about firms going overseas? And the, the simple answer is to say, I really like firms going overseas, but I don't like industries going overseas. So, so long as there's enough to keep a critical mass here. So, so like um, Datacom roughly has about 700 staff in New Zealand and about 700 offshore. And that's, that's fantastic. And it may be in 10 years' time they have 800 New Zealand and 5,000 offshore. And, you know, that's, that's great. Um, but what we want is that the software as a service industry develops in New Zealand rather than, say, if, you know, a business like Datacom exited in a really, I don't know, uh, unhelpful manner, and they took a whole of the industry with them, and it, and it kind of faded. That would be a bad outcome. Um, the interesting one is how different countries do this. So at the moment, if um, you know, Sally and Dean Enterprises have this great initiative to head up to Australia and, and start up this exploring business, uh, we can go down and see NZT and get an international growth grant. And we might have to put in a bit of money of our own, but we might be able to get I don't know, 300 grand from everyone in this room and get off and, and do some great things in Australia. And if while we're over there, someone says, this is an amazing business, we'll buy it off you and we sell it, how do you guess how much of that money we have to pay back? The answer's none of it. If we're in Israel and we're taking that 300,000, if we had to pay it back, we'd have to pay back 1.8 million. Okay, so there's different penalties to exiting. Um, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but there is something about, I think, you, you Chief, it's about getting enough grit in the system such that, yes, New Zealand internationalises, but you, you retain the ecosystem in New Zealand. Thank you, Dean. Kieran? Uh, I actually find myself agreeing with Dean, which is really <laughs> shocking. Um, <laughs> That uh, you know, Mariana Matsukata and others are talking about you know, innovation has a rate, but it also has a direction. And you know, she's been instrumental. Um, you know, she sometimes um, needs to tone down. But uh, directionality and conditionality of post-COVID recovery money. You know, in the European Union, if you're getting money to recover from COVID, then you're having to accelerate your low carbon transition. You're having to improve uh, workers' rights and conditions. There's conditionality to the money. She goes so far as to say, you know, that where the state's investing, um, not only should they be paid back, they should have equity. And there are some, you know, uh, the US also has uh, some arrangement. It's amazing. The industrial complex narrative in the US is completely different to reality. They're enormously supporting frontier firms uh, you know, up to their eyeballs. So um, I think we should explore those models, and that's quite interesting. Uh, and the second thing is capabilities matter. Uh, they matter as much, if not more, than uh, grants and, uh, and money and introductions and trade promotion and, and diplomacy. Capabilities of firms and managers in are uh, often the forgotten children of innovation and industrial policy, and we shouldn't be forgetting that. I'd agree with all of those things, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I don't think we should be. I agree with you, Sally, that you know we need to have a very um, open view about the exchange of ideas as opposed to it all being a one way <coughs> and that we get the, you know, the capital returns from usually they get reinvested in the New Zealand economy um, and so there's quite a few ongoing benefits from, from that exchange um, and I see no, no, no issue with that at all um, and I'm not even sure I agree with the conditionality thing um, <laughs> but I think um, yeah, yeah, I think I think New Zealand needs to do do more to be an attract you know, have attractive e innovation ecosystems that really do keep people there. There's there's already ones that exist though, and we need to work with the ones that are that are already here and, and as Murray said, build around those um, to the sort of related and supporting industries. 
and that's where we get the greatest, I guess, stickiness of, of those investments over time, even if you don't have conditionality on individual grants, so to speak. Great, thank you. What one more. Yeah, yeah, I want one more because um, it's, it's something in this report I just wanted to bring up was it has this really good articulation of why exporting is a good thing, and then it <coughs> does that, which is a little single diagram, this, this cool little door thing. And I just wanted to kind of point out that that's going to turn up in a whole lot of briefing to ministers, <laughs> and it'll we'll, we'll go from a hundred and something pages down to two pages with that thing there. And um, the report talks about um, access to international markets so allows you to specialise and scale up. So like Hamilton Jet, if it didn't export, it would be Hamilton Marine Engines or maybe just Hamilton Boats, and they would, wouldn't really be able to narrow on the thing they're really good at. And that would impact on the productivity of that company. But by exporting, they can scale up and specialise. But my fear is a little simple thing like that that turns up in a minister's briefing could go the way of the business growth agenda, um, which is exporting's good, importing's bad, exporting's better than domestic production. Um, that was a tough time in my life, and I hopefully <laughs> don't have to <laughs> live through that again. Um, yeah, careful with that, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Look, we, we're right at time. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, we, we sort of, I do need to pretty tech diaries and finish on time. I will. Um, I'll give Murray sort of 30 seconds uh, to a minute uh, to sort of, if there's any sort of final re reflections or um, any points you'd make to, like, quickly like to make to the room and then. Um, well, just, just to say that, as we said at the outset, I mean, this is critical stuff and it's really hard. And, and <laughs> participating in a uh, OECD forum on productivity session the other night, you had you know, guys like Jason Furman on one side very much in the camp of saying there is no place for any of this stuff at all. Uh, you can, and nobody can do it well uh, through to the Diane Coyles and others saying, well, you know, there's market failures all through this stuff and private sector won't do it, so find a way to do it properly. Uh, it, it, how you do it, implementation is, is, is right at the core of it and it takes a whole bunch of skills uh, and persistence, actually, I think, um, uh, to come back to the uh, to the uh, boardroom slaughtering itself every nine years, um, and and we struggle with that in, in New Zealand. So I'll leave you that. Right, thank, thank you, Murray. Now, apologies to those of you who had questions. We we just we ran out of time, which I is a good sign because it shows how interesting uh, the discussion was. So, thank you for making the time to come today. Thank you to those people who attended online. Thank you to Roseanne. A uh, bit of an experiment to do it with teams, but certainly the right thing to do when we think we had as many watching it virtually as in the room. I think that's definitely uh, the way. Thank you to the panellists and for your excellent contribution. Uh, and particularly thank you to uh, Jeff and Murray for, for making the time today and for presenting on this excellent work. Um, so um, if you could just join me in thanking uh, them all of you. Thank you. I should have mentioned, as Jeff put up, um, it is draft. And would love any further feedback um, so you can just find the material on their website and submissions submissions uh, submissions thank you